and welcome to Small Spark Theory. This podcast is designed as a collection of thoughts, ideas and practical tips on using marginal gains to help your agency new business endeavours. Small Spark Theory is created and hosted by me, Lucy Mann of Gunpowder Consulting. Hello and welcome back to Small Spark Theory. Today we are going to be talking about agency language and copy. Now, way back in the first year of this podcast, we did an episode on websites. And as part of that, we looked at not only the content on websites um, and the, the technology and the functionality of websites, but we talked a little bit about messaging. And then last year, we talked to David C. Baker about agency positioning. But I wanted to spend a bit more time focusing just on messaging and language. And I know it's something that lots of agencies Agencies are struggling with. So I am delighted to welcome to the pod today Roland Gurney. Roland runs a copywriting agency called Treacle and specialises in agency copy, which is a brilliant thing, and that makes you the perfect guest <laughs> for this oh, podcast. Thank you for having me. Oh, welcome, welcome. Before we get started, tell our listeners a little bit about your background and what led you to set up Treacle. Sure. Okay, well, it's quite a long and meandering story, so I'll try and keep it relatively succinct. So I I suppose I've always been creative and always enjoyed making things, and I've always had an entrepreneurial streak in some way. So I set up my first business when I was 19. It had gone bust by the time I was 20, but I learned a lot of useful lessons along the way. Then I kind of got into the music industry after that. Mm -hmm. I was a music producer and a DJ and had a lot of fun playing around the world and getting to travel, going to festivals, lots of partying. And then eventually that lifestyle kind of caught up with me. And so I moved into teaching and I taught music for a long time in a, in a creative college. And that was great, but eventually I felt like I was giving away a lot of my creativity and I wanted to channel it into something a bit more entrepreneurial again. So I set up Treacle originally as a brand copywriting agency. So we were working with agencies, but mostly on their client work. Our original new biz strategy, I kind of hand wrote a hundred letters, put them in very nice black envelopes with gold handwriting and sent them out. And we booked a load of meetings off the back Lovely. of that. Lovely. And we met some really influential people who gave us a chance and, and saw that we were really good. And we kind of snowballed from there, basically. Fabulous. And how much of the work that you do now is actually creating agency copy as opposed to brand copy? So funny timing that you asked that. So at mm. the minute, we made we made a transition about six to eight months ago, I suppose. We looked through our client list and realised that actually two-thirds of the work we were doing was the agencies themselves um, and that we weren't actually doing that much client work anymore. They, they were coming to us because they wanted to use us yeah. for their own messaging. Yeah. And so we made a real pivot and we specialised and we niched down and we kind of jumped in both-footed to the agency world and it's totally snowballed since then and we've really worked out a framework and a way of working and a process and all of those things that that make them stand out because as you know there's a lot of similar messaging out there and a lot of hollow hype and empty sentiments that don't really mean that much and to be honest we had that for a little bit and then when we niched our messaging became super targeted it really connected to agency owners on a level that they could see themselves in Mm. and we've really attracted a tribe of followers. But the weird thing is, we get more brand work now than ever. Oh, really? And I don't really know what that is, but I think it's that brands are attracted to the confidence that we show from the website because we're very clear who we are, what we stand for, and who we serve. And I think they want to, they want a piece of that. So 2020 was planning to set up a brand side as well, which will service brands, but it's, yeah. Lovely, watch this space. Watch this space. Yeah, yeah. And within the sphere of agencies, obviously, of which there are very many, mm. is there a particular kind of discipline or do you kind of get involved across across the board? Totally across the board. Okay. So we work with experiential agencies, design agencies, brand agencies, video agencies, yeah. everything across everything. the board. Yeah. yeah, we're kind of agnostic in that sense. Um, and a lot of the best copywriting principles are fundamental and they apply yeah. across industries, let, let alone agencies. So. Yeah. Yeah, we're not we're not niched into any 
particular agency. That would be too niche, I think, yeah. even for us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mentioned before about the, um, you know, the positioning bit. Mm. And, uh, and I know that that's something that agencies struggle with, trying to find their point of difference. And um, I guess it can, it can end up becoming a little bit of a pickle if we, if we try and find that difference just by using the words without actually addressing the, the difference in the first place yes. and, and the purpose. And h- how, do you, how do you manage to unpick that? Well, every agency has an angle. There is always something unique, mm. um, and it takes a process of digging a little bit deeper. So we run workshops, and we, you know, we, just as any agency does, a kind mm. of immersion process. And um, we'll interrogate them, constructively mm. question everything. We'll mm. push back quite a lot. We don't really just let them tell us. We will we'll probe into it. And it's about finding that one angle. So for some agencies, it's, it's all positioning. So we're just working with a, an agency in Manchester who are a digital e-commerce agency, but we've worked together with them to mark out that they really want to work with ethical brands, you yeah. know, purpose-driven products that are kind of disrupting certain markets. And so that became the angle. Yeah. The copy was easy once we really understood that. Sometimes it's a bit harder. Sometimes it's more a process. So we're working with an agency who their big differentiator really is that it's the extra mile they go in the relationship, the kind of the above and beyond nature. So we really pull that out and make that front and center. That becomes the value proposition. That becomes the about page. So once you've got that, it's the copy flows easily. Yeah. We call it a clarity session, but it takes that deep dive under the hood to yeah. really understand the bigger picture so yeah. that we can make the messaging resonate. Fantastic. I mean, we could go on for hours talking mm-hmm. about this because I'm sure in your time and certainly in my time, we've seen a lot of agency copy howlers. Mm. Um, but what would you say are the most common mistakes that you come across? Sure. I would say, I mean, there's a, there's lot and there's lots, and mm. I don't mean that to sound disparaging. No, no. But I mean, we do a kind of a free ten minute web copy audit for agencies, and okay. so we go through this process quite a lot. So there's there's some things that always seem to crop up, which I would say the main one is everything is about the agency. So yeah. it's all we. Almost every sentence starts with we or yeah. are. Yeah. And I would say probably ninety percent of the agencies that we deal with come to us with what is effectively a one-way pitch to yeah. potential clients yeah. on their website or their comms. And so the biggest thing really is that fundamental flip, which is it's not really about your agency. Yeah. It's about the client and yeah. what you give, what they get from working yeah. with you. Yeah. Not your process, not really your beliefs. It's not really about your mission statement. Yeah. It's what are they going to get yeah. from working with you, not what you're going to give them. Um, and like we touched on, I think the positioning thing is huge. Has, what's the big reason why I would choose you? So I used to have a job doing new business for a creative college, and I was connecting apprentices with creative companies. Okay. So I'd have 20, 30 tabs of agencies open on a browser. Yeah. And sometimes I'd be flicking through looking to find contact details, and I had no idea yeah. what that agency did. Yeah. And I had no idea why... I would want to contact them or, or yeah. they, there was just no clarity. It was all just brand yeah. BS. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of that. I think that clarity needs to, to come through. And then I suppose the third thing that I see a lot of agencies not really maximising is the potential of their blog as part of a new business strategy. I see mm. it really as like kind of stories about the office dog or, you know, parties or... Their bake-off. The bake-off or t- really top-line industry focused things or about blogs about general design but things that aren't problems that are keeping their clients up in in the evening they're not worried about the state of design or the conceptual thinking they want a problem solved and they want to know why you're the the agency to do it yeah okay and the beauty of that that blog copy is even if your website isn't attracting lots of visits once it's there you can just repurpose it so many ways can't you yes and, and I notice your your post about newsletters and you know newsletters are dead and you know but the blog is a missed opportunity but actually if the newsletter is repurposing really interesting blog content then and, and it's just a channel to direct more people to the lovely content that you've got on your blog then that's that's what it should be about yes right? totally yeah. yeah I think there's just it, it isn't really for news no, <laughs> that's, no. that's the misnomer about it I think is that you know nobody 
really cares if it's Karen from accounting's birthday no. or anything like that. I think it no. has to be, you know, it has to have a strategic outcome. And yeah. I know that's a waffly thing to say. Yeah. I think the word content has done a lot of disservice to, yes. to the whole blogging because content just sounds like something that's going to fill a void of some kind rather than it being focused. Yeah. It just became about quantity rather than quality, yeah. um, SEO fodder, that kind of thing, whereas yeah. nobody's really leveraging it as a way of getting their foot in the door with great brands or yeah. you know the people that they really want to work with. So yeah. Yeah. it can be done better. Yeah, very good point, very good point. You mentioned contact details and all of those browser tabs being open and finding it quite hard to yeah. be able to contact agencies, and that's that's certainly been one of my bugbears. Mm. And we chatted earlier about contact pages, and I know that you've you've written a post about contact pages. This is probably one of the things that I rant about <laughs> the most when right. it comes to agency websites. And I know one of the things that you wrote about was that an agency may have invested a lot of time honing their homepage copy and about us and then then just throw up a contact form yeah. on the contact page and it feel and realistically what kind of marketing director is going to fill in a contact form and also there's no idea of who it is they should speak to so I'm interested partly on your insights on the contact page sure. but also the idea about showing teams so mm. this is a conversation quite often that I have with particularly small agencies and they, when they're putting together their website and they're looking at all the copy, they're nervous about showing <laughs> the people because they're nervous about showing how small they are. Mm. Whereas actually I think that's such a missed opportunity because agencies are about the people and their story and they make up the agency. It's not this sort of mythical thing. It, it's made up of, of people. And being able to see the people and know who it is that you're contacting, I think it's quite important, right? Yes, I think it's, yes, it is. Especially with small agencies, I totally agree that, you know, we work with a handful of small agencies and they need to reframe that there's, that, that size is actually an asset. Yes. And, and it, you can work that, it, that it needn't be a disadvantage. And mm -hmm. actually nowadays, I think brands and clients are wising up and wanting you know they don't always want big agency no. bureaucracy they want agile they want access they yeah. want those things and so a lot of the agencies we've worked with recently we've had to reframe exactly that that yeah. way of thinking and we pulled it out to be to be selling points basically on the copy on their messaging which yeah. is you know you're not going to speak to layers and layers of account management who you get in who you see is who you're going to get i yeah. think that's been a really big turning point that's been huge and in terms of the copy itself the contact copy it's always a bit of a missed opportunity because you've spent 95% of your time honing, like you said, honing this messaging, yeah. honing the copy, moving them through the site brilliantly. And then the final point, just at the point of getting them to do what you want them to do, which is click the button or yeah. pick up the phone, it all goes very sterile yeah. and there's a get in touch or, you know, talk talk to us today and a, a sort of a formidable looking form that yeah. nobody really wants to fill out. There's no humanity. At that point, this is the point where potential clients want to take this from being a digital relationship to a human relationship. Yeah. It's at that point they want to build a one-to-one -one relationship. Yeah. That's a pivotal point where they need to feel a human connection on the other side of that screen. And if they don't, and if it all goes cold and distant and a bit too digital, they bounce. The moment's lost. The moment's lost. Yeah. And so it's really important. And that doesn't always mean it has to be cutesy and come for a cuppa. It doesn't no. have to be that. But even, like you said, who you're contacting is great. Yeah. Getting a sense of what the next steps will be once yeah. they've clicked that button, just yeah. showing them the other side of this process. Yeah. Um, that's huge, and it, it bumps conversions up yeah. instantly, just yeah. having that warmth. Brilliant. I'm interested in it because I, I, there's definitely been a huge shift in the way that businesses speak to consumers certainly and I think from a business to business point of view that tone of voice is is catching up I'm interested in your thoughts on what has kind of prompted that change and and are we going to see more of that sure yeah so I think we'll definitely see more of it I, I suppose it's awful to admit but maybe it's the innocent smoothies effect which always gets cited yeah. as the tone of voice that's reeled out and mm. wheeled out as examples of that but I do think at some point 
somebody who breaks the mould and does B2B communications and copy a bit more relaxed, a bit more fun and a bit more informal gets mm. a bit more of a commercial edge. Yeah. And so others look at that and start to relax and start to see that there, there's, a, there's a myth that there's a B2B language yeah. that nobody wants to speak, but everybody was for a while, but nobody speaks like that in real life. Yeah. C-level people don't speak no. in huge corporate jargon. And so I think there's been a shift partly off the back of social media and that's really brought to fore the, the importance of copy, concise copy, human copy, relaxed tone, chatty and conversational. And again, that doesn't need to be cutesy and fire emojis and lolling everywhere, but it just, you know, a bit more talking how you would talk in real life. And also in terms of consistency and brand consistency, it doesn't make any sense to present a really jargon heavy B2B kind of language but then when you get in the room or they come for the meeting it just doesn't match up there's a disconnect and branding's all about consistency at every touch point and so it has to work all the way through the journey not just from day dot of trying to persuade them so I think I think we're going to see a big shift there already is we're doing a lot of tone of voice work for agencies and brands who want to solidify a way of talking Mm. a system that means that they don't slip back into that outdated yeah. B2B. Yeah. It's interesting. I'm, as you were talking, I was just thinking about banking. And for years, I've been an HSBC customer mm. from Midland Bank days and got was horrified a few years ago when they sent me an email wishing me a happy birthday. And it just felt so... <laughs> bizarre from such a corp such a corporate brand and insincere and Mm. all wrong and yet I've just last week opened a Tide account and every single piece of communications that I've had from them the copy is so beautifully Mm. done and it's very simple very spare but just really resonates and says we'll we'll look we'll look after the banking so you can get on and do we know you're busy you can get on and do what you do it's all along those lines just think oh hallelujah that's it absolutely resonates yes and when it's done well it it you really feel it don't you yes there's a new generation i think and banking's a great example mm. with you know the the rise of the challenger banks that have come through recently like you said tide yeah. and monzo and starling yeah. have instantly yeah pushed away from that corporate yeah. communications and that, yeah. that tired copy. So yeah, it's the same with Bulb, the electricity company. They have really good personal human emails that yeah. really feel like somebody's writing to me, not just a generic mail shot. And yeah. That really connects. And that's gonna uh, you know, that's shifted so far from the utility companies of old that would send you those monthly bills full of hieroglyphics that you had no way of understanding mm. what it actually meant and how much energy you've actually used and whether it was right or not. I mean, it's it's just a massive, massive shift, isn't it? It's a shift fundamentally, not just in language, but I think in business mm-hmm. and generally, which is, and this is the same for agencies, is, is that, that shift from being a top-down, one-way communication to yeah. it feeling like an inclusive, two-way conversation. And that's a big fundamental copy, but also a business shift that people mm-hmm. want to be brought into the conversation and spoken to on a level, not as you're an agency talking down to me as a potential client and that's a, that's and a I, I suppose it's all it all comes down to user experience doesn't it it's all part of the user experience and making that as seamless and delightful as possible yes yeah absolutely So what would be your top three tips for agencies to improve the way they talk about themselves? That's a great question. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the first one is, I think we kind of touched on this earlier, but it's that big flip from we to you. So this is a challenge, I suppose, to any agency looking to revamp their website copy or in fact any comms but to see if they could write it without using the word we or are at all what a great challenge um and if you you will find that you have to use you and your and instantly the 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 impact of that is that it builds rapport with whoever's reading it it makes it paints a picture a vivid picture of how their life is going to be somehow improved how you're going to solve a problem it totally brings them into the conversation um, and it feels less like a pitch and that's a huge shift. So it's not easy to do. And 
it can feel a bit odd at first to frame everything in that way, but once the whole copy is framed in that way, it's super persuasive yeah. and much, much nicer to read. Um, number two is a kind of copywriting staple, but I don't think enough agencies really take it seriously, which is it's not really about the process or your beliefs. It's really about the benefits for the client. So a word that we don't kind of see enough is get. It's a small word, but it 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 signifies to a reader that there's some kind of tangible outcome or result for them. So getting something, get something. And that's a real, ben it's the benefits, not the features. And that's a, it's, Great. a, it's a real basic. And then the third one, again, we've kind of already touched on, but it's about positioning and picking an audience. Mm. Because when the copy is just general, um, it just feels hollow. It feels a bit empty. Like we said, it, it can end up effectively just trying to polish something it you have to really know who you're talking to understand them on a deeper level and then answer those those challenges those problems those concerns all of those one by one and that's what's going to get them to click the button or pick up the phone or whatever it is you want them to do but there's too much vague sort of industry brandy sort of waffle that that really when you boil it down doesn't actually mean much to people it's not what keeps them up at night no specifics of what sell effectively yeah. yeah brilliant they're fantastic tips and i think it's worth mentioning that all of these things take time yes or investment if if they need um, external help to do this and generally external help is really really useful and will help them get to an answer quicker but the potential return on that investment of time or external resource is is huge yes absolutely so i mean we always say this and if the copy and the messaging that we do or that you do brings in one client it effectively pays for itself yeah. but it will last longer than that so yeah, the yeah. value of that you know yeah. goes up and up over time yeah. and so agencies need to see that as an investment and you're absolutely right about the external viewpoint it's the cobbler's children yeah. analogy which is you know i understand that you know agencies are busy making their clients look yep. great and i totally understand that but sometimes coming in without knowing the agency and being deep and not knowing the details that that ignorance is our biggest asset because we ask such basic questions yeah. that we we can only see it from a, a third party outsider's view and that gives us that clarity that they can't get generally because they're knee deep in it on this podcast we're always really interested in where we can see an opportunity for marginal gains mm -hmm. because again because of the the agency model, it's all f so focused on billable time, as we've just said, and and it's hard for agencies to carve out time or budget or resource to be able to, to think about these things. So we're always looking at for the, the small things where they can kind of move the dial a bit. Where would you see the opportunity for, for marginal gains? So I think something that a lot of agencies could do is kind of maximize the impact of their website for example so a, a real simple thing that you can do is to set up some kind of optimization now this might yeah. sound a bit nerdy but it's not quite as geeky mm -hmm. as it sounds yeah. so nowadays there's, there's lots of really good free tools so you can set something up like hotjar which will let you watch how people interact with your site not in a creepy stalker way but mm -hmm. in a, a totally anon anonymous kind of mouse movements way yeah and you can see how people interact and where you well, you lose them effectively, and then you can make very small copy or design changes yeah. to keep them. It's a practice that's totally normal in e-commerce or software as a service yeah. and other areas, but I think a lot of agencies don't quite leverage the website hard enough, or they think mm. of it as effectively an online creds deck. They yeah. throw it up, yeah. leave it for a few years, and then occasionally when the pipeline's looking a bit less full, they'll panic, yeah. try and do it themselves very quickly, make a bit of a hash, not really get much alignment, can't get everybody in a boardroom to agree where they're going, and it becomes designed by committee, yeah. which is the worst kind of design because yep. everybody's pulling in different directions. So having a kind of optimization, iteration mindset, setting up a few very basic back-end systems and just seeing yeah. how people actually use it yeah. and making informed decisions rather than guessing yeah. is the big thing that they could do. And testing things, as you say, testing things, and particularly with more uh, more established agencies, perhaps those that were late to digital still have a quite a kind of fixed mindset about a website and yes. that it's, it either has to be completely overhauled 
or or stay as it is. Yes. But most websites these days can certainly changes to the copy can be made and and we can move things iteratively rather than having to have that that wholesale change. Absolutely. I mean, it's so simple. Uh, you can install Google Optimize, which is free. And you can A-B test your home page with different value propositions without yeah. having to know a single line of code. Yeah. You can literally just rewrite a different value proposition. It will show 50% one, 50% the second version, and you can just see which one people like better. Something as basic as that, but agencies just, and I understand it's a time pressure, mm. but there's an opportunity to make sure your big value proposition is actually what potential yeah. clients want, want yeah. which seems so basic. And if you had that, why wouldn't you make... Yeah. the most of it no exactly brilliant i'm wondering what book you would recommend to our listeners okay this is interesting so i had i narrowed it down to two which i know is a bit of a cop out no no two's two's fine so they're kind of different ends of the spectrum mm-hmm. the first one is richard shotton's the choice factory which is a it's about it's almost a behavioral science um book which it kind of explains how humans have patterns and react in certain ways and how we can use those and understand those and, and, and employ those, which is the more intellectual end of the Lovely. book choice. Lovely, I love the sound of that. It's, yeah, it's very good. The other end, I suppose, is is a bit more American in style. So it's called Cash Vertising, which I Ooh. know, I know, <laughs> bear with me, by Drew E. Whitman, um, which is a hundred, it's called something like, it's a hundred ideas that you can employ basically to sell things which sounds crass and I understand it is a crass book it's yeah. a very crass book and I got it as an audio book and he narrates it and he's just totally over the top and it's brilliant but what he says is a hundred really useful things that could be boiled down and applied to any agency's copy you just have to bear with the bullshit a little bit okay okay they sound amazing. If we were to give one of those away, which one should we give away? Oh, that's a good question. I'm actually going to go with the slightly less cultured cash advertising. Brilliant. Uh, I love that. Okay. Because people won't have probably read that, whereas I think more people will have read The Choice Factory. Okay. So, listeners, you know what to do. Join in the conversation on Twitter at Gunpowder Tweets using the hashtag SmallSparkTheory, and we will pick a winner and send a copy of cash advertising Roland's uh, recommended read my last question I would love to know what's the best piece of advice that you've been given in your career that you can pass on to our listeners again I'm going to cop out very slightly so this is kind of it's not verbatim advice it's something that's kind of been boiled down I suppose mm-hmm. over the years of doing this but it, it's a little cheesy mantra that we kind of have to work by and it's basically thinking hard makes writing easy so it effectively kind of means we, it's not about the words it's about the ideas before the words lovely and if we take that time to really think things through the words are easy off the back end i love that that's been so helpful roland i'm going to include all of the links to your website Fantastic. in the show notes and on linkedin because there's a wealth of brilliant tips and information on your website on your very useful blog Thank you. Um, which is giving back as uh, agency <laughs> blogs should do uh-huh. and uh, taking your own medicine uh, so yes we'll we'll provide links to all of that and you've been a brilliant guest thank you so much thank you for having me it's been great you're welcome thanks you have been listening to small spark theory brought to you by gunpowder consulting Join in the conversation on Twitter at Gunpowder Tweets using the hashtag SmallSparkTheory. This podcast is created and hosted by me, Lucy Mann, and edited and produced by Isabel Jarvis. Music is provided by Duke Deck, available at dukedeck.com. If you'd like to find out more about our online, mentored, new business courses, visit smallsparktheory.com, or for information about our consulting, visit gunpowderconsulting.com. And if you enjoyed today's episode, head to iTunes and leave us a star. This episode was recorded at The Pod at White City Place.